Hi everyone, welcome back to another video with me, Adrian Lee, the Wandering Art Historian. As I'm sure you know, we are talking about how to read a painting with this web series, and we're currently in the midst of discussing how color is uh, used in paintings. Um, and we've already talked about orange, purple, green, and red. So what color are we going to discuss with this video? The color yellow. Now the thing about yellow is that it can be kind of contradictory. Um, we've already talked about some of the challenges we face when we study color in art because it change, meanings change over time um, or they change from culture to culture, but they can also have positive and negative connotations at the same time and that's why it's a good re uh, idea to talk about the color yellow. Think about it. Uh, yellow sometimes represents gold or light or the sun, but it's also sometimes associated with illness or stigma. Think about like being jaundiced or what, what do we call people who we think are afraid, we call them yellow bellied, right? They're yellow. And so it's associated with cowardice. It can be associated with a warning, envy or disgrace. But in India, it's associated with Krishna and avatar of Vishnu. So it's a spiritual color associated with peace and knowledge. And in China, yellow is associated with royalty and the masculine principle. During the Qing dynasty, only the emperor could wear the color yellow. So it's definitely held in high regard. We've all heard the phrase, blondes have more fun. I don't know if that's true or not, but we often see fairy tale princesses and heroines, goddesses, even Eve of Adam and Eve fame is often depicted with long flowing curly blonde hair in art. However, there's kind of a, a dark side to that. In ancient Rome, prostitutes dyed their hair blonde or wore blonde wigs to let everyone know that they were prostitutes. So maybe blondes do have more fun. Eh. What does Kandinsky have to say about the color yellow? I think he has strong feelings about it. Let's see what you think. Yellow is if steadily gazed at in any geometrical form has a disturbing influence and reveals in the color an insistent aggressive character. It is worth noting that the sour tasting lemon and shrill singing canary are both yellow. We're starting to see how Kandinsky really feels about this color, right? Yellow is the typically earthly color. It can never have profound meaning. It may be paralleled in human nature with madness, not with melancholy or hypochondriacal mania, but rather with violent, raving lunacy. Gee, Kandinsky, tell us how you really feel. And I know that seems kind of extreme, but there may be a little something to that because there is a famous artist from all of art history that if you bring up the color yellow, you might think of him because it was his favorite color. And there is a discussion that needs to be had around the idea of madness. And if you're saying maybe that's Vincent van Gogh, then you would be right. Famous for his bright yellow sunflowers, correct? Now we have to bring up Van Gogh, when we talk about the color yellow, he lived in a yellow house. Yellow was his go-to color and not just for the sunflowers, but look at how much yellow appears in his work. All of these paintings are from his time in Arles in the south of France, where he was drawn to the light in nature. And so that may have something to do with all of this yellow that we see. But then there's that madness element that Kandinsky brought up. And I have to say, I feel like madness might be a very strong term. We often associate Vincent van Gogh with madness, but I think it's better to use the term mental health issues because it removes the discussion between does genius lead to madness and vice versa. 
Now, Vincent definitely had some mental health issues. If you look at these two paintings, you may say, well, they're bright colors, yellow, red, green, but they don't necessarily feel very happy or very positive, and that was intentional. Uh, Vincent van Gogh was the type of artist that felt that feelings and emotions were the most important part of art, and the best way to express your feelings and emotions in art was through color. So let's look at an actual quote from Vincent van Gogh about this painting here on the left called Night Cafe. He painted this in September of 1888. That was only a few months before the ear incident. I know you know what I'm talking about. This is what he said, quote, in my picture, the night cafe, I've tried to express the idea that the cafe is a place where one can ruin oneself, go mad, or commit a crime. Yeah, good job, Vincent. I definitely get that feeling. And if you look at this self-portrait of him on the right, this doesn't really feel or even look like the Vincent van Gogh we've come to know and love. He's in a bright yellow suit, but he's painted this sickly green, pea green color behind him. He has a furrowed brow, his beard is patchy, and his hair is unkempt. And if you're wondering, maybe that's his feelings and emotions coming through in a self-portrait, I think you're right. He painted this in November or December of 1888, right before he cut off his ear. So Kandinsky may be a little bit right when it comes to the, yellow, uh, the color yellow and some mental health issues. However, if we look through art history at large, we see another interesting trend associated with the color yellow. I wanna tell you the story behind these two images. Here we have another diptych, two panels, right? However, it's telling the story of the justice of Emperor Otto III. Now, this was an interesting story that was very on trend for the 1400s, um, especially for the Dutch. They painted this story and hung this uh, hung artwork depicting this story in um, places of ruling, like courtrooms and things of that nature. Um, and it was to encourage just ruling of the magistrates, like, hey, let's be fair to the citizens and rule justly and fairly. That seems like a good thing to do, right? Why were they drawn to this particular story? So what you see here are a number of different scenes being told in two panels, okay? Um, and it's the story of a man who's wrongly accused of a crime. And that's this gentleman right here in white, okay? Um, you see him talking to this nice lady who's dressed completely in red, um, and she's got her head down and it looks like she's praying. That is the man's wife and he is accused of attempting to seduce the emperor's wife, okay? But he says, I didn't do that. And he's talking to his wife and he's like, babe, you gotta believe me. And she says, you know what? I do believe you. I don't think you really did try to seduce the emperor's wife. The only problem with this is that his wife is the only one who believes him and he is thus murdered, decapitated. He's executed for this crime that he didn't commit. And that's his body right here with all the blood. Ooh, we got, we got murdery again, real fast. Sorry, I didn't warn you. Um, she is here, the wife, holding the head of her dead husband. But this empowers her to go to the emperor and say, hey, guess what? My husband was telling the truth. I believe him. I don't think he set out to seduce your wife. And the emperor, that's what we see going on here in this right panel. The emperor, emperor is taken aback. He's so surprised by her determination to clear her husband's name. That's why you see her kneeling. She's holding her dead husband's head, and she's uh, handing the uh, emperor a scroll claiming his innocence. So he is so surprised and uh, dumbfounded that he says, okay, well, we need to make sure you're telling the truth. So what you need to do is 
stand on these hot burning coals. And um, during the Renaissance and Middle Ages, uh, torture was basically used as um, a, a way to force you to tell the truth. Like, it sounds wrong, but that's what they did. And the point was that uh, the longer you could endure the pain and not change your story, the more closely you were to the telling the truth. Does that make sense? It was a, a lie detector test. Oof. But she stood on the hot coals, held true to her story, and swayed the emperor. And he realized that he had made a mistake. And to rectify that, what you see going on here in the distance, it's very tiny, that's the empress, his wife, being burned at the stake for lying. Um... Yeah, happy, happy ending? Maybe, maybe not. Here's the thing. There's not a lot of yellow in, in these paintings, is there? Except for one thing, right? The executioner's outfit is almost predominantly yellow. You see him right here? He's got this giant sword. He's just chopped off the guy's head and held it, or handed it to his wife. And I thought, now that might be interesting to explore. Before we move on though, I wanna point out one really awesome little thing. Uh, do you notice the sleeping puppy here at the foot of the emperor? That puppy seems a little out of place, doesn't it? Pup a public hearing is not the right place for a puppy, but I believe it was included because of its symbolism. Um, dogs are often associated with fidelity and loyalty, especially in marriage, which is how we get the nickname Fido for a dog. And because the dog is sleeping and is at peace, it's an emphasis on the fidelity and loyalty between the husband and wife, even in his death. How awesome is that? So with the color yellow, let's, let's go down the rabbit hole of the color yellow for a hot minute because I thought, well, it's being associated with an executioner. That can't be good. What else has yellow been associated with throughout art history? And I made a very interesting discovery. Um, here we have two panels. Um, both of these are by Giotto and they date from about 1305. You can find them in Scrovegni Chapel in Padua, Italy. Um, and he was, uh, commissioned to paint a number of incredible frescoes depicting scenes from the life of Jesus, okay? And here we have this scene with a gentleman in yellow talking to this guy. He's received a bag of coins and there's a creepy demon-like figure hanging out next to him. That's definitely not good. And then we see this panel over here with the same figure in yellow. And if you're like, hmm, I wonder who that figure is. I wonder if it's Judas. You are correct. In both scenes, Judas, the ultimate betrayer, is clothed entirely in yellow. So much so that in the scene on the right, we barely see Jesus. Do you notice he's still here in the center of the of the of the painting with the halo, but how Judas approaches him to kiss him and is completely engulfing him in his yellow cloak. So we start to think maybe yellow is associated with the idea of, or the act of betrayal, because Judas would definitely be the ultimate betrayer when we talk about religious artwork, right? He betrayed his friend. Um, but also look at this. In this scene, same scene, um, it is when the Roman guards come to arrest Jesus after the Last Supper and praying on, uh, on Gethsemane, that whole, you know, Easter. Um, so what happens is Judas approaches him and gives him a kiss, but St. Peter, who you see here with a halo, is so overcome with anger that he actually attacks one of the sh soldiers and cuts off his ear, and Jesus heals the gentleman's ear and puts it back on there. And I wanna point that out because do you notice St. Peter is also in kind of this yellow cloak wrapped around him and 
St. Peter holds such a high place in, in the Catholic Church. He's considered the first pope. He holds the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Why would St. Peter also be wearing yellow? Well, if you think about it, Peter also did betray Christ, and Jesus predicted it. He said, tonight you will deny me three times. And he was like, no, I would never do that. You're my best friend. He's like, it's going to happen, buddy. And it did. So even Peter, someone who is venerated by the church, kind of carries this color on him as a reminder that he still denied Christ. Interesting, isn't it? I went through looking to see if maybe my hunch was correct about Judas and the color yellow. And for the most part, it seems to be spot on. Here are three different paintings of the arrest of Christ from three different artists from three different time periods. Um, and each one depicts Judas in the color yellow. Here he is with Jesus all in blue. Here he is with his yellow sleeve reaching around and in the far painting on the right covered completely in yellow. Let's look at these two paintings. Now, um, I'm guessing you can probably recognize who painted these with the dark background, the idea of a beam of light creating a spotlight or a theatrical effect that we call tenebrism very dynamic paintings, lots of action and movement and drama, and, and a bold use of color. And if you said, well, that would make it Caravaggio, then you're right. Oh, good job, I'm so proud. Both of these paintings are by Caravaggio, and what's interesting is how they use the color yellow. Caravaggio, we see here, here is Judas kissing Jesus, and we see his sleeve in yellow. Mm. And then this painting on the far right, the denial of St. Peter. It's so sad because we see the Roman soldier and this woman that says, hey, that's the guy you're looking for. And Peter clearly reacting negatively like, who, me? With a beautiful yellow cloak wrapped around him. Oof, such a powerful use for the color yellow and still Kind of sad, isn't it? I think so. Now, an interesting thing happens. We've been seeing Caravaggio and other artists use the color yellow to represent betrayal. Um, but something interesting happens. And I wanted to show you these two images um, that we have already seen. Caravaggio here on the left and the story of Judas slaying Holofernes. It's interesting that we see Judith here wearing a yellow dress because isn't she a heroine? She's our hero. She's the, she's the woman who saved her people from the Assyrian army. So why would she be in yellow? Well, it could suggest that she did kind of betray Holofernes by being beautiful, attending the banquet and accompanying him to his boudoir making him believe that they were going to have a party of their own. Hmm. But I don't know. I, I mean, maybe. What's interesting is the painting on the right um, by Artemisia Gentileschi sees Judith in this very bold, yellowish gold dress. And what's very interesting is that she painted this exact painting a second time with Judith in blue. Now that's really interesting. However, I wanna focus on this idea of Artemisia Gentileschi and her female figures in the color yellow. These are two more images depicting different scenes from the story of Judith slaying Holofernes by Artemisia Gentileschi. And here we see Artemisia in this amazing golden yellow robe. Stunning, right? And in this version, the maidservant is wearing yellow. And I thought that was very interesting. I wondered how frequently did Artemisia use the color yellow with her female figures? And the, res the answer is a lot, okay? Um, here we have the um, Mary Magdalene in a beautiful golden yellow dress. Here we have, oof, this is a rough story, the story of Salome 
who danced before King Herod, got the head of John the Baptist on a silver platter, and we see her in a yellow dress. However, we also see her as Saint Cecilia. Um, we also believe that is a self-portrait, perhaps, of Artemisia Genileschi. Um, here we have this amazing story of Jael and Sisera. Um, Jael is this nice lady, and this is a bad guy, and she's got a tent peg, and she's about to ram it through his, his temple. So, mm, murder, again, but she's considered a hero, and it's a religious story, okay? And then in this amazing image here on the far right, we have Queen Esther, who goes before the king, completely dressed to the nines. Look at this incredible golden yellow dress. And we see her in the act of passing out because of all the feelings and the emotions that would go, because she really risked her life going before the king to also, again, be a heroine and save her people. So I have to say, what is Artemisia Genileschi saying about putting these strong female characters in the color yellow? And not all of them are heroines either. Uh, we would not call Salome a hero in the slightest, right? Let's look at this image. Oh, it's beautiful. We've already seen this. Um, it's the Annunciation. It is again by Artemisia Genileschi. And let's look at how she specifically uses the color yellow in this painting. Here we have Gabriel in this amazing golden yellow cloak. Um, do you notice how he kind of creates a, a triangle by pointing up to the heavens where we see this golden yellow light? But he's also got his arm here holding lilies, another symbol of the Virgin Mary and her innocence and purity. And Mary is here in red, the red of humanity, covered in the blue of the sacred and divine, but with a hint of yellow around her neck. And when you connect the yellows, it makes this amazing triangle. Do you see it? So it makes me wonder that if Artemisia was in instinctually or specifically reclaiming the color yellow away from the idea of betrayal and a negative connotation and maybe just repurposing it. I'm not gonna give you a specific answer. I kinda want you to mull it over and think about it for yourself. That's part of flexing your art history muscles is taking all of the information and learning from it and developing your own thoughts and ideas on it. And you're at a point where you can totally do that, okay? Um, thank you so much for taking the time to watch this video. Um, if, if you can, donate a dollar or two to my virtual tip jar, that would be awesome and I would be so grateful. If you can't, maybe share these videos with people who you think might wanna learn more about art or subscribe to my YouTube channel or like or comment. All of that helps. And I just wanna say thank you so much for tuning in time and again to watch these videos. I'm having a blast and I hope you are too. Until next time, I'll see you later. Bye.